The Houston Midtown Chapter of the Society for Financial Awareness presents Money Matters with your host, Christopher Hensley. Good morning, everybody. You're listening to Money Matters. I'm Chris Hensley. The time is now 10 a.m. Got a great show lined up for you today. 110 million Americans live amongst such high levels of air pollution that the federal government considers it to be harmful to their health. Now, that was true at one point. Right now, we're in kind of a murky area with climate deniers and the upset in the federal regulation that's going on right now with the environment. But This topic is more important than ever. So as a finance show, where is the intersection between banking or finance and the environment? Our guest today is the founder of First Green Bank, Ken LaRue, and we will do a deep dive into the intersection of finance and the environment. So please stay tuned. Keep listening. Ken will be joining us very, very shortly. But if you're a longtime listener, you know we always reserve the first few minutes of the show to tell you a little bit about what's going on in the Gulf Coast and Houston area when it comes to financial literacy and financial education. I am a member of the Houston Money Week leadership team, so we have officially come to the end of that. But I do encourage people to look at the website, which is www.houstonmoneyweek.com, because Because even though that event takes place in April, we have so many community partners through nonprofits, for-profit banks that are doing community reinvestment work, for-profit companies that are also wanting to go out there and do free financial education classes in the Houston and Gulf Coast community area. And so I would encourage you, even though the event's over, uh, the website, HoustonMoneyWeek.com, there is a calendar function on there. And so as these free events come up, they're actually going to be posted to that calendar and they're for the public. 99.9% of these are going to be free and open to the public. Now, I'm actually going to be doing one that I we just found out this morning on June 21st at noon. And this one is actually sponsored by Houston Metropolitan Federal Credit Union, and I've actually done talks for them. And usually these are in front of the city of Houston employees, the public library, public employees there in the Houston hub. But they've actually expanded these as well because they started these talks maybe a year, two years out, and they're actually starting to expand those. So most of our events are open to the public. This one is actually closed, and it's open to all city of Houston employees. It's going to be out at JFK Boulevard, 16930 JFK Boulevard. It's going to be on June 21st at noon, and it's going to be on you and your credit score. So some tips and ideas and parameters around how to get your credit back on track, things that you need to know, things that you need to be aware of. So this one is free, but it is only open to City of Houston employees. So I'm sure that they're going to probably post this on their website, or you can get in touch with the Houston Metropolitan and Federal Credit Union to find out a little bit more about that event. And with that, let's go ahead and get our guest, Ken, on the line here. Ken, are you there? I am. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I always kind of start the show the same way. I like to share your bio with listeners so that they can get to know you just a little bit better. Now, Ken LaRue is the founder of First Green Bank. It's a local bank with a global mission. LaRue works tirelessly to turn Florida green one customer at a time and is actively engaged in the community. Under his leadership, LaRue helped grow the bank full service value centers to offer customers quality service and ethical business practices that are based on core company values. And that's what we're going to talk about today are some of those. You're also a founding member of the North American chapter of the Global Alliance for Banking on Values and helping promote positive changes in the banking sector. Ken, once again, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you again for inviting me. Absolutely. Would you be able to share a little bit about yourself maybe outside of the bio so listeners can get to know you just a little bit better? I'm sure, yes, I'd be glad to. I was born in a small town in central Florida, uh, Eustis, where I still live, and the bank was actually 
chartered here. This is the second bank I formed. I, I started uh, Florida Choice Bank in 99 and sold it in 2006 and then went on a cross-country road trip with my wife. We bought a little mini motor home and put a trailer on the back with all our fishing gear and bikes and circumnavigated the country, which is something I, I recommend to every American if you can ever get a chance. But on that trip, I read Yvonne Chenard's autobiography, Let My People Go Surfing. And uh, Yvonne is the founder and owner of Patagonia, as, as many of the listeners will know. And it inspired me the and I thought, well, if he can do it in clothing, then surely I can do it in banking. And that was the impetus or the genesis of First Green Bank. And I applied for the charter in 2008 and was granted the last charter ever granted in the state of Florida on December 22, 2008. There's been none since, which is a very disturbing development because, in my opinion, small banks are the backbone of small business in America, and the number of small banks in the country has dropped precipitously in the last 30 years. So that's just a a little little bit more background on the the bank and and me. I agree 100% about the small banks, the credit unions, the community-based banks. It's neat to see the unique perspectives. I think that's really the story here and why I'm talking to you because First Green Bank, there is a mission there and it's based around the environment. And I want to say that it's unique because you were one of the first. I don't know of any other ones. I'm sure there might be out there. But tell us a little bit about First Green Bank and what kind of the idea behind it is. That's a a really kind of almost a it's become an evolutionary $64,000 question. <laughs> when I started it, my gig is the environment. I used to call myself a rabid environmentalist, but that really kind of offended some of my more conservative customers or shareholders, so then I changed it to a committed environmentalist. But that's the foundation upon which the bank was launched, and so we just looked at everything and said, so what does it mean to be a bank that's focused on environmental stuff. How can we make a difference? How can we move the needle? So we developed a a solar power loan program that I think is the best one in the country still to this day, 100% financing, 20-year amortization fixed rate. Uh, We don't take a lien on your house or your commercial building, but that just didn't seem like enough. And then we offered rate discounts for anybody that does a sustainable project like a building or a development, that didn't seem like enough. So we just, everything we could touch, we tried to touch. All our buildings are built or renovated as deep uh, sustainability standards as we can. For instance, our founding building is a lead platinum. It was only the second lead platinum commercial building in the state of Florida when we built it. But then I became involved with the Global Alliance for Banking on Values, and it was, you know, the game changer, as they say. I went to the first conference back in 2012 that I was invited to in Vancouver, and I was sitting in a, at a table at lunch with all these CEOs from banks and financial institutions around the world, and it just blew me away. And I went around the room and said, I just got to ask, what's your religious affiliation? The first guy said, well, he's a Muslim. The second guy said he was a Muslim. The third guy, a Catholic. The fourth guy, Hindu. And I said, wow, this is really interesting. You know, you two Muslims are, you guys are evildoers, according to my president. That was Bush at the time. Right. And so they had a chuckle, and and I'm sitting here thinking, these two Muslim guys who are CEOs of banks that are doing fantastic things in the world, uh, one of them being Brock Bank in Bangladesh, who at the time was doing 8,000 microloans a month. It was mind-numbing, and I went away from there thinking, I'm not worthy. I'm not, I wasn't worthy to have a seat at that table. And I came back to the bank and told my management team and my board, we got to do more. And so what started as an environmental focus just turned into more. And so we're constantly trying to define what more means. You know, is it, is it social equity space? What can we do there? Is it programs for our coworkers? What can we do there? And, and one example there, two, three years ago, we introduced a living wage program, and we took the Department of Labor statistics for what constituted a living wage in Central Florida, and it came out to 29000 some odd dollars. So we said, well, let's make our minimum wage at the bank $30,000. And of course, it cost us money. Was we had tellers, all our tellers made less than that. We had clerical people that made less than that. 
but it was the coolest thing ever when I rolled it out in the staff meeting. The look of disbelief on everyone's eyes and then the looking around the room and you could tell they were thinking, who just got a raise? And people smiling and people clapping. And so we did that and we raised it $1,000 every year. So we're up to $32,000 now is the minimum wage that we pay any of our people. So it's it's become much more than just an environmentally focused thing. That is awesome. And one of the things I want to talk about is the First Green Foundation, because it sounds like maybe a nonprofit came out of this, but I'm going to hold that one <laughs> for a second here, because you said a lot of stuff there, and I just want to unpack some of the stuff that you talked about. You talked about the solar low, low financing for solar energy, sustainable builds. You talked about this living wage program. I know here in the Houston community, our mayor, our former mayor, and I, I believe our current mayor, too, we had a change a while back, but the green builds, the environmentally friendly architecture and builds here were a big part of our economy. And so with the stuff that's going on at a federal level, I'm starting to worry a little bit there because one of the words that you said was sustainable. It just makes so much sense. It's very intuitive to me that this is a positive way to to put dollars towards this, put people to work, build infrastructure. And so any movement away from that is scary to me, but I don't want to get too far into the politics part of it. But I'm in agreement with a lot of the things that you said there. Can you give us maybe some more examples of how the bank is doing the right thing for the planet? A number of things. Some of them are really more fun things that aren't gigantic change agents, but then when you start multiplying it from the people that experience it, uh, we have a program at the bank where we do zero rate financing for any of our coworkers that drives a car that gets over 40 miles to the gallon EPA combined mileage. So now a very large number of our coworkers drive high mileage cars, high MPG cars. And a lot of our coworkers couldn't afford to buy a new car because they were upside down in their gas hog. And so then the light bulb went off and I thought, well, what if we paid them to drive a fuel efficient car? So I approached a couple of my coworkers and said, if we wrap your car with First Green Bank in Disha, and pay you $300 a month to, quote, lease the space on the side of your car, and that'll be enough to cover your car payment. Would you do it? And then we had a bunch of takers, and pretty soon we had 11 cars running around the community with First Green Bank all over it. Wow. What a neat idea. (laughs) Yeah, and and like I said, it's a small thing. It's a fun thing. But if other businesses followed suit with stuff like that, it could really be impactful. But the cool thing, the really cool thing was the wives, and this was always the wives, would come into the office and say, well, my husband and I drove that Prius, the bank Prius, you know, over the weekend to go on a trip, and he came back and said he just loved that car, and that's after he stepped out of his giant SUV, and, you know, he always thought it was a toy car, and they were silly, and all that, you know, bunny-hugging stuff, but he loved it, so... To me, that's a win, you know. When, oh yeah. When you can convert a Southern, well, in Texas, the same deal. You know, a Southern boy that's just not going to get out of his pickup truck to a Prius. That's definitely a win. <laughs> yeah, that was one thing. We also had an employee loaner car that's a Prius that employees can check out anytime they want for any reason. And again, that's to try to get them used to it and and, and experience the coolness of being able to get in their car in Central Florida and drive all the way to Atlanta on one tank of fuel, you know. Those are just a couple of programs. There's many more I could continue if you'd like. Well, I'm going to throw a statistic out there because you just happened to mention the high mileage cars. If the number of cars keeps increasing at its present rate, there will be over 1 billion on the road by 2025. There's currently around 700 million cars on the road today producing 900 million tons of carbon dioxide each year. This equals approximately 15% of our total output. Sadly, one half of these trips in the U.S. are within three miles and can easily be walked in less than an hour. So the idea of just introducing more of these efficient cars and not only is it a neat win-win idea for the bank and for the employees and everybody else, but it is doing something good for the environment and I would say definitely a huge change agent thing there. And that was just one example, I think. That's pretty cool. Let's kind of sidestep just a little bit because one of the things when I was researching for the show, I saw that you guys had a what's called the First Green Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about this? That's a foundation. It's a 501c3 nonprofit we started 
um, shortly after the bank started, to just do stuff in that format that couldn't be done really in the bank. And we fund it with 2% of the bank's profits every year and, and additional funding sources. And originally, we thought the biggest impact would be giving grants to people to do solar when solar was way more expensive. For instance, when we built this building, it was $8 a watt. Now it's down to basically 250 to 280 a watt. So we provided grants to people, and it really helped propel the solar power thing in Central Florida. But we've since moved away from that, and our most recent project was we provided seed money to a local government jurisdiction called the Lake County Water Authority to buy a pivotal piece of land in a preserve that is a very, very important wildlife corridor across central Florida. So our money allowed them to leverage some state grants and buy a much larger piece, and it wasn't hugely expensive for the foundation, but it made a huge impact. So we're going to try to do more of that kind of stuff and possibly do more in South Florida and related to the uh, uh, sea level rise. We have an office in Fort Lauderdale, and that is the absolute hot topic in South Florida. And it's it crosses the aisle politically because it's going to affect real estate property values. It's going to affect the economic viability of all of South Florida. Absolutely. This is such a neat concept. You said something kind of haphazardly there about 2% of the bank's profit is going towards this nonprofit. I think that's fantastic. Is that unique to, are there other banks out there? This sounds like such a neat idea. Are there like a community of banks that are doing this or are you guys the only ones out there doing this? Well, that's a great question. I wanted to touch on that. The Global Alliance for Banking on Values was an organization that was started in 2009 by Peter Bloom, the CEO of Triodos Bank in the Netherlands. And we joined in 2012 as a member. I joined the board in 2014. My board, no, 2015, my board tenure just ended in March. And part of that was a large expansion of member banks in North America. And there's a lot more than you would think. There's not nearly enough is the downside, the unfortunate side. But there are a number of banks that started with the premise of being values-based right right in their DNA and their charter like we did. One of them is New Resource Bank in San Francisco. And I actually, when I was getting ready to charter this bank, I actually called and talked to the CEO, and he gave me a bunch of tips. There's another one, Beneficial State Bank, and that's founded in Oakland, California, and they're now all up the entire state of California, up and down from there. Very, very successful values-based bank. They're doing a lot in the social equity space. Sunrise Bank in Minnesota is another great example. Uh, David Rylings, the CEO, Amalgamated Bank in New York, which was a bank that's largely owned by unions, and it was started to support the Amalgamated Clothing Workers Union. They're doing great things. They're about $3 billion. So there's a, a number of them around the United States that are really doing great things. And then in Canada, they have a different model. They don't have entrepreneurial banks like we do in the credit unions are taxed, whereas in the United States, credit unions aren't taxed, which creates an unfairness situation. But in Canada, the credit unions act more like the community banks act in America, and there's a number of values-based credit unions, including Van City, which is a giant credit union in Vancouver, um, I don't know, $18, $20 billion, and they're doing fantastic stuff in the value space. That's huge. I mean, this is the way I'm kind of thinking about it or putting my mind around it is as an entrepreneur, or as a business owner, or any CEO company, companies will go through these exercises where they'll do a mission statement and they'll put their values in it. But then maybe that's never even revisited. And so a lot of the times you see that as just kind of an exercise that they do, but is it really, are they taking it to heart? This is a whole network of community-based banks and credit unions that are putting those values out there and actually taking action. I love that. That's fantastic. I'm going to do more research on this global alliance. That sounds like such a neat idea. Now, Ken, as you were Growing this idea or bringing this to fruition there, there's probably some roadblocks that you ran into. What are some of the biggest roadblocks that you've run into as you were putting this idea into action? The first roadblock, which was huge, was the federal regulatory agency, specifically the FDIC. When you charter a bank, they assign a caseworker that basically leads the charter application. 
and coordinates everything early in well, actually, it wasn't early. It was probably about three quarters of the way through the process. I had a meeting with our case manager, and he sat down and said, "Look, this whole green thing, this whole you know environmental thing, that's just a niche thing, and that makes you a niche bank, and we don't like niche banks." Mm. And I think part of it was the fact that they were trying to not grant any charters at all in 2008 because the world was melting down. Right. I was so befuddled, I didn't even know how to respond other than to say, you know, I hesitated for a moment and said, wait a minute, we're a community bank. We're going to be a state-chartered, FDIC-insured community bank. We're going to do all the good community bank stuff, but we're going to do it with a conscience. Um, What in the heck is wrong with that? So they finally granted our charter, and we were viewed with a high degree of skepticism by all the regulators for the first couple of years. I mean, it was just, it was like pulling teeth to get them to, to really get on board. But now they love us. They applaud everything we're doing. They've involved a bunch of their different uh, department heads. And it's really fun. It's really, we have a great relationship with all the regulators. And they are actually looking to us for guidance and in certain areas, like, you know, how we can expand CRA, Community Investment Act, yep. stuff, and stuff like medical marijuana. We're the only bank in the state of Florida that's banking the Florida medical marijuana industry. That was the biggest hurdle, and we overcame it. The second biggest hurdle is really the uh, the haters. <laughs> <laughs> haters got to hate, and so they're going to figure out something to hate and taking, you know, nasty shots at me for being a, a liberal and a bunny hugger and all that kind of stuff. The it's always heartwarming to have the opposite of that with people that really like what we're doing and move their accounts from the big bad banks um, to us. So that's always nice. And that's huge to have an option. I mean, with everything that we've heard with the major banks, I think Wells Fargo was one of the last ones that had a sales ethic issue come up but you know starting with 2008 and on we could go through a whole list of them so just having an option of a community-based bank or a smaller bank is one thing but then having an option that shares the same values that you do is huge it's not just a another option for you it's a way to for you to do something good out there in the community you talked about two things you talked about that charter in 2008 and we all remember what was going on in 2008 so i can imagine that was a huge roadblock to get through, but you were able to do that to the extent that now the FDIC is looking and having questions or how are you doing these CRA things and are we able to help emulate these to other community-based banks? That's awesome. There's always going to be haters. That's the second thing that you said. (laughs) There's always going to be haters out there, but it's great to see you doing this work. We're bumping towards the end of the show here. What have I forgot to ask you that you want to tell our listeners? Well, gosh, you've about covered everything. The one other big thing that listeners might want to delve into and do a little research, we became a B-Lab certified B Corp just recently, and that is another fantastic program. B-Labs is a nonprofit that certifies companies, and the B stands for benefits, and they look at basically all the different elements of what it takes to be a responsible company. So even if a listener is not the CEO of a bank or a financial institution, your company, even if you're a small company, can become B-Lab certified and a B-Lab certified B corporation. And it really means a lot once people learn what it is and the millennial generation really understands it, they get it, and, and it's a big shot in the arm for your business. Well, Ken, thank you so much for joining us today. We're right here at the end of the show. For listeners who'd like to find out more about Ken, you can visit his website at www.kenlaroe, that's L-A-R-O-E dot com. And then I'm also going to give the website here for the bank, which is firstgreenbank.com. If you're driving, you don't have to write it down. And if you're on the podcast, you will have a link to it. Ken, once again, thank you so much for being on the show. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. Have a great weekend. Uh Bye-bye. Bye. And you have been listening to KPFT Houston. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Money Matters Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, visit us on the web at www.moneymatterspodcast.com. 
drop us a line on SpeakPipe on the right-hand corner. It will receive any voicemails, questions, thoughts, concerns that you have about the show. In addition to this, we recently launched a Patreon campaign. Click on the Donate Now tab to hit the tip jar and find out what Patreon's campaign is all about. 